Now we move into the effector functions of antibodies. Um, there's, here's a slide that I, I, we've looked at in the past, but it is so good. I just love to share it over and over because it really is a fantastic summary of the different types of antibodies, the different functions, and which ones have the, the most of those functions. So you can see that IgG as a whole, all of the different groups of IgG or subtypes of IgG have a whole bunch of um, actions, right? They're really great at neutralization, really great at obstinization. They can, they're small, they're pliable, they can get all over the body. And so they have a lot of, a lot of function. Where IgM, pretty much only activate complement. IgD, pretty much only sensitize basophils. IgA, great at neutralization, uh, and then IgE, really great at um, helping with eos uh, um, parasites, so eosinophils and basophils. But um, I just love this table. And so we'll break down each one of these types. We'll group all the IgGs together, but um, uh, we'll, and we kind of already looked at this already once the semester, so hopefully some of this is going to be a review. But in any antibody response, IgM is the first antibody to be secreted. We saw that uh, when we looked at last lecture. And when IgM is in its secreted form, it's going to be a pentamer. Now, this isn't the exact structure of it. Um, it tends to be a little more lopsided than what this image is showing. But it is a pentamer where all the FC portions are together and they're joined by a joining chain. So because there's five different um, monomers put together, that means there's 10 binding sites. And with 10 binding sites, you can see how it could strongly bind to a microorganism because of just the sheer number of attachment points. And uh, because it has the ability to strongly bind to the surface of a pathogen, it can activate complement really well. And we're looking at the antibody activation of complement. And so this is the classical complement, um, classical pathway of complement activation. This is the third way that complement can be activated. And we, we've touched on it already in the past, but this is now the place where we're going to dig a little bit deeper into it. Now, even though IgM is really great at activating complement and it's produced first and it can do okay, it's really not that awesome because it's so big. And because it's so big, it's not able to get into a lot of sites. And so the extent of where this antibody can get um, is, is limited. It can't leave the blood and just pass through, diffuse through the tissues like we see with IgG uh, because of its, its big size. So it's limited in its, its action there. But now IgA and IgG are going to be produced once the infection continues and you have the T follicular helper cells sending cytokines to turn on isotype switching. And so IgG and IgA are going to be produced. They're going to have very high affinity affinity maturation. Um, and they also are small. And so they can get through tissue a lot easier than say the IgM. And, um, and so they're just, they're able to get into places that the bigger molecules can't. And IgG is by far and away the dominant antibody found in the circulation in the blood. Now, besides being a defense to all the tissues reached by the blood, from happening in the blood. And so they can bind up pathogen that are floating around in circulation and prevent it from interacting with tissue. And so that is how um, um, infections are prevented, right? So antibody play a really big role in preventing um, infections going septic or in a, going throughout the entire body system. be the structure that IgA is secreted in, in at least in the mucosal surfaces. So uh, the gut, the um, upper respiratory tract, the upper GI tract, 
uh, nose, yeah, all of those. Oh, and the, the genital tracts, urinary tract, mammary glands, all of those um, secretions tend to have a lot of dimeric IgA. Uh, the structure is pretty much what's shown in that schematic where you have the two FC regions facing each other joined by a joining chain. And what's also on there is called a secretory component. And that secretory component will allow the IgA to stay in the mucus and transcytose across from the lumen of the, um, or transcytose from the tissue of the body into the lumen of the gut. Um, yeah, so that's because the IgA secreting plasma cells are on the mucosal side of the, uh, the epithelium. And so in order to get that IgA to the other side, transcytosis has to occur. And so this, um, that's what's happening in this image here, where we have the mucosal, we have the, the like tissue side here of the body. And then this secretory component is attached and then it will transcytose that IgA all the way through across to the um, lumen of the, of the gut. So called transcytosis. Um, and then when uh, the IgA is out in the gut, it's able to interact with pathogen microorganisms at that micro, uh, mucosal surface and prevent those pathogens from attachment to the epithelial layer or colonization of the epithelial um, mucosal epithelium. So does a really great job of neutralizing before pathogens can make its way into the tissue or interact with the tissue. This is also true during pregnancy, IgA can transcytose, IgA can get through um, <clears throat> the placenta and into the bloodstream, uh, IgG can, sorry. IgA is transferred through the um, lactation, through the mucosal surfaces there. So at birth, baby has IgG profile and titers similar to that of mom, because it's going to be moving through the system just like uh, it is in mom. But after birth, once all those IgG molecules have um, disintegrated after about six months or so, then the proteins just break down, then the way that baby gets antibody is through um, breastfeeding. And so mother's milk is going to be rich in IgA. And this process of transfer of antibodies to baby is called a passive transfer of immunity because baby didn't have to do anything. Baby immune system did not have to make IgA, did not have to make IgG, but rather baby got it passively from mom's immune system. We'll talk more about that later in the semester, but we'll bring it up now that if, if a person doesn't make its own antibodies and it gets them from somewhere else, it's called passive transfer of immunity. So there is a window in time during a baby's first year of life when they have um, almost no antibody it's a, until they start making their own. And so they're particularly vulnerable to infection. Uh, and this is the point at when mom's IgG starts to drop off. So we have birth here, and this is you know the highest level of IgG because it's practically the same as mom. But over the first six or so months, that IgG amount decreases because it's a protein and it just breaks down after time. And there's a point where the baby hasn't started making enough of its own IgG. And so there's this window where there's not a lot of IgG there to protect baby. And this tends to be when they get most sick. So you see colds and runny noses and ear infections and stuff happen around the six to 12 month um, age. Now, if baby is breastfeeding, they will get some IgA to help with that, but IgG still is going to be very low at this point of life. Speaking of IgG, so IgG, IgE is kind of a funny duck in that it, um, once it gets made, it pretty much gets bound immediately by basophils and mast cells 
um, and eosinophils. It really doesn't circulate in the system for very long. So the receptors that mast cells and basophils and eosinophils have on their surface are called FC epsilon receptors. FC epsilon receptors are going to be a receptor for the FC portion of an epsilon antibody. So an FC epsilon receptor is going to bind to the FC portion of IgE. So as soon as IgE is secreted, it's going to be bound to the surface of these cells. Um, <clears throat> and this will be in connective tissue, um, maybe like right below mucosal surfaces. Um, if it's a mast cell, it'll be yep, in the connective tissue. Um, eosinophils can be circulated in the blood, but they're also going to be just in the, the mucosal surfaces and then basophils, whatever. There's so few basophils, it really doesn't matter too much, but they're going to be circulated in the blood. But they'll grab these FC portions of the epsilon or of the IgE and bind it. And so mostly IgE is found on the surface of these three types of cells. Then when a parasite, let's say it's a worm, a multi, so like you have this worm here that has multi epitopes all over it, um, is picked up by the I or the antigen receptor portion or the variable portion, the FAB, right, of the IgE, two or more IgE molecules have to be activated and that's called cross-linking. And when that happens, then that's going to activate these cells, eosinophils, mast cells, basophils, to degranulate degranulate, so they have these big granules in them that contain a lot of histamine um, or other smooth muscle dilators. And they will cause, uh, depending on what tissue it's in, will cause some pretty violent reactions. So like sneezing, um, coughing, diarrhea, if it's in the gut. And the whole purpose of those processes is to rid the body of whatever is causing the infection. And so the major function then of IgE is to protect the, the body against parasitic infections. This can be a unicellular protozoa, and it can also be a multicellular worm, or maybe even an arthropod if you get like a, an insect in there. Um, the cytoplasm of mast cells, yes, has these, these granules that contain histamine, inflammatory mediators, and then when that cross-linking occurs, which we'll see here, that degranulation occurs. So you have your IgE bound to your FC epsilon receptor. It's going to recognize multiple epitopes on the surface of this is, in this case, we're looking at a multicellular worm. And that cross-linking will occur. That will tell the eosinophil, time to degranulate then that eosinophil will degranulate, spill its toxic chemicals right on the surface of the worm and um, hopefully burn it to death. This is the plan. Uh, it could also though lead to diarrhea to get the worms out of the gut. It could lead to sneezing to get them out of the, the nose, wherever they're at. Um, but really those granules are pretty toxic and they can be harmful um, to the uh, parasite. So these inflammatory mediators then um, that are released by mast cells, mast cells are in the tissue. And so you'll see that, oh, as well as basophils, eosinophils, um, they will increase the leakiness of blood vessels. So that endothelial lining will open up just a little bit and allow cells and fluids and other proteins to move out of the bloodstream and into the tissues. Well, we know that when fluids and proteins and cells move into the tissue, that's going to cause swelling. So that would be an accumulation of fluid and that would lead, lead to pain, um, redness, swelling, and that's all part of inflammation. So we see uh, inflammation increase when eosinophils, basophils, and mast cells degranulate. 
but inflammation for a parasitic infection is pretty beneficial because it to defend against a parasitic infection. This is great if you live in, but we are in the age of human development where a lot of places on earth have pretty clean countries are developed to the point where parasitic infections are actually pretty low. Now, parasites, definitely, if you look at across the world, there's many, many, many places where there's still high instances. Um, uh, immune system that will, will fight these infections. But for places where parasitic infections are rare, sanitary country, um, at least when we look at ways that we can get infections, like water, drinking water and, and, and things like that. And so our system that works against parasites. So oftentimes we see these response or grass, <laughs> you know, things. and so people that have allergies will make recognize these allergens. And then when the mounting an immune response, just like any pathogen, not a threat a subsequent encounter with that specific allergen will lead to a secondary like a, a an infection and the body will respond Uh, mast cells, which will cause histamine. We we know what can all happen with allergies, and potentially in extreme cases, the allergen can cause such a degranulation of of um, these cells that leads to anaphylaxis, um, and, which is a systemic life threatening inflam uh, inflammatory response. So. We will look at allergies a little bit more later in the semester, but this kind of gives the background as to what cells are involved, what uh, antibodies are involved, and how they can come about.